Matthew 24, verse 6, and I'm reading in the NIV. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Hmm. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Yeah, no <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word, word and to share what I feel is a, what you've put on my heart. Thank you for the service. Thank you for that uh, previous song we just watched and how you can change lives and do amazing things through amazing people. All the glory be to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as I was saying, I was struggling with the title. Um, hmm is all I could come up with. <laughs> Because that, that's how I felt this week, you know, watching events unfold uh, in the world. I, I just, I, my mind was just really going in a million different directions. Um, and so when I, I knew that I was pressed against the wall to send Steve a sermon title, I just said, hmm. <laughs> what was that? Right, and even after three times, all I could come up with was, hmm. But honestly, that's, maybe we all have felt that way this week. Just kind of like, hmm. And it's events like that are going on in the world that makes us want to escape. Isn't that right? Um, not escape reality, but the truth is we do need a break now and then from life. Uh, the mountains are a beautiful place to go. It's not responding. Mountains. There we go. The mountains are a beautiful place to go. I love mountains. You guys know that. Some of you may, may like mountains. You surround yourself with a grand landscape, and it's just kind of, it's like medicine to the soul, isn't it? For want of a better way to put it. But some of you like oceans. How many of you like the ocean? You know, sitting next to an ocean and listening to the waves crash, and then the sound of that swishing of the water going up onto the beach and the sand and then receding. Uh, that's a beautiful, tranquil place to be, as long as there's not any volleyballs hitting you in the head or... You know, too many kids screaming and running around. But even that is kind of a joyous sound as well. But oceans, for many, are a very tranquil place to kind of decompress. Um, many like just being in the forest. Um, I love forest. I love being amongst the trees, and just it's a very tranquil place uh, for me. Some people like being near a river. Uh, how many of you like sitting next to a river and just watching the water, you know, um, flow? It's just it's a very wonderful thing. And some love being near lakes, um, a very still, calm lake. Sometimes the air is barely moving, and the lakes are almost like a mirror. Um, and you're just amazed at, at, at creation. Uh, even if you're not a Christian, it's just people feel like they can decompress in, in all of these areas. And if you can't get away, um, you can also lose yourself, escape much of what's in life, um, in different subjects, like history. You can delve into history and just kind of get lost in history. Studying history, you can get lost in art. Um, I have an art degree, and um, I love Monet and all the, a lot of the different painters, um, um, a lot of them out there, Picasso, everything from the Impressionist to Picasso and the Fauvist, the bold colors, and um, you can really kind of get lost in art. And you can also get lost in astronomy. Anybody um, have a telescope and love looking at the stars here? Um, well, probably one, we've at least had a time, an option or two, an opportunity or two to look through a telescope and to see a, a planet a little further closer than we can with the naked eye. It's an amazing experience. Um, let's just know how small we are and how vast the universe is. You can really lose yourself uh, in that subject. And some people can lose themselves in biology. Um, kind of get lost in the study of biology with all of its intricacies and, and amazing uh, facets as well. And how many of you like to travel? I think we all like to travel. It's just we all suffer with <laughs> thin wallets at times, right? Yeah. But if you had unlimited money, you could literally travel and travel and travel and travel, right? And you could just make that your, your escape. Just keep on traveling. Um, and then some of us just like to be home, right? How many of you just like to be home? Tara and I are kind of like, you know, I mean, we, we like to get away when we can, but we also like just being home and working around the house when we have time. Um, we like that sort of a thing, and so maybe home is what you love. You remember what Dorothy said? <laughs> no place like home, right? Now, home can be very, very volatile for some people, but 
even Ellen White says that everybody should make home a little piece of heaven on earth as far as possible, right? You know, so home can be, should be a very special, special place where at least at the end of a, a long day, you can come home and feel like you can decompress in the safety of your own home. And it's interesting the thing about home, we discovered about a year and a half into COVID that with people being forced to stay home, it was interesting what was happening when more time was being spent in the house. Um, fathers were connecting with their kids in, in better ways because now, in, you know, instead of being so consumed by the busyness, now they were uh, in some situations actually watching the kids where maybe it was the wife before or the nanny or whatever have you. So there's some interesting positive things that came out of COVID because we, people were forced to stay home um, for a time. But the thing is, the reality is that in our age of immediate access to information, you really, you can go to the mountains, you can go to the lakes, you can go to the ocean, but you're really never far away from what's going on in the world. Isn't that right? And so the truth is it's very difficult to escape and to decompress because the world seems to be at our fingertips in our day and age. Isn't that right? At our fingertips. And what has happened this past week with Russia's invasion of Ukraine I don't know, how do, how do you feel about this? And you know, that's, <laughs> Bonnie's rolling her eyes, right? And that's why I said, hmm, scary. it's scary, it is scary. Let me ask you a couple of questions. How does it make you feel about justice? Or injustice, I should say. Angry. Angry. How does it make you feel about your freedom that you have in this country, freedom? Grateful. Grateful. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire was recently voted the most free state Notice most free, because there's really never, there's no place where it's completely free. But praise God for that, right? I'm glad that we live in New Hampshire. So I'm glad about my freedom, the freedom that we have. How do you feel about um, being so far away from the conflict? You know, sometimes it makes us feel or have this false sense of security, being thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away from the conflicts of the world, right? Yeah, there's conflicts in our hometowns and in our cities and in our own country, but, but you know, it, it, we feel sometimes insulated when these things are going on so far away from the United States, from our homeland. How do you feel about our country's actions or inactions in the situation with Ukraine? And maybe we have different feelings on that. I've got some very strong feelings. I won't tell you what they are. <laughs> but how do you feel about our country's actions or inactions? regarding this war in the Ukraine? And then how do you feel about the reasons for war? The fact that war really is inevitable in a planet filled with imperfect people, many of which are hungry for power, hungry for supremacy, who are so convinced of their own agenda, almost to a, a sense of re that it's a religion to them, that they can see the oppression of others and the domination of their own power and will as being justified. Our world is full of people like that. And thus, our world has a history of being riddled with wars. These are really uncomfortable questions to deal with, aren't they? I would much rather be sitting in front of some vast vista, you know, of mountains or at a lake. But, you know, even Jesus told the disciples when they were so busy in ministry and they were almost getting burnt out because there was so much to do, even Jesus told them and said, come aside and rest a while. So it's not wrong to, to disappear from the realities of life as far as you can, right? Even Jesus prescribed it now, 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 that now and then you need to come aside, break away from it all, right? And rest a while, decompress, give your brain a chance to just kind of re center itself. Even Jesus prescribed that. But the reality is at some point, we have to face the fact that war is not going away. Isn't that right? War is not going away. The uh, world has been filled with senseless kings and emperors, men who are self-focused and callous to the, to the needs and disadvantages of others, those whose supremacy is their goal. And we also should remember that God's people in the Bible also lived in a world, maybe not as technologically advanced, as advanced as we are today, but they too lived in a world riddled with war, right? God's very own people were subjects of war at times. We're certainly in the midst of worlds, in the midst of nations who were 
clashing against each other. God's people certainly knew what it was like to be in a world filled with war and to fear the imposition of those who held absolute power, right? So, let me ask you this morning, or let's reflect for a moment, on what their perspective was in the midst of a wor world riddled with war and trauma and chaos. And I think this verse in Hebrews kind of hints at it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 to 16. These all died in faith. You know, the he book of Hebrews chapter 11 is talking about the great men of faith of the Bible, right? Men who lived through crises. They all died in faith, not having received the promises, that is what God promised them of an eternal home, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So here in the book of Hebrews, Paul is saying that these great men of old, if they had wanted to, they could have returned to the to the country from which they came. And he's referring to Egypt, right? God called them out of Egypt. And you know, in the wilderness, there were times where Israel was saying, why did God bring us out here to die in the desert, right? Mm -hmm. and, and many times they said, it would have been better for us to die in Egypt. And so Paul is contrasting the men of faith, or he's, he's emphasizing that these men of faith knew they could have turned back and considered this world their home. But they didn't. They pressed forward in faith. First, believing that they were strangers and pilgrims in this world. In other words, this world was not really their home. Their home, but not their home. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And they recognized that, but more than that, they held on to the promise and the faith that God had a better place for them than what this world can offer. Amen? Amen? that God was preparing them a better place, a heavenly country. In fact, the verse right here, right here says homeland, and, and we use that term for our own country, the United States. Isn't that right? Homeland. That's got a nice sound to it. And there's times where we're proud of our country, and there's times where we're maybe not proud of our country. I'm very proud of our, of our country all the time, but there are times where our country makes decisions where maybe we don't feel that proud of it. Isn't that right? pieces of our history in the past, how maybe we had treated others from a different race, you know, um, how maybe this country was founded, wasn't all founded on glorious decisions. But as a whole, as we look at this country, we ought to be proud of where we are, amen? amen. And the freedoms that we joy, enjoy, especially when we look at how freedoms are being taken away from others around the world needlessly and unprovoked. But the point is this, there is no heaven on earth, isn't that right? As much as we may love the United States, there is a better place. Amen. And as much as you may love your home, and we like our little home, making it better, and maybe you have a little home that you love, you can call it home, and we should call it home. But it is not our ultimate home, amen? amen. And so Paul is, is reminding us that, that the great men of God, God's people, God's people, always have this dual perspective that we are citizens here and we have a home, but our ultimate citizenship, citizenship is in heaven. Amen? Amen? And we are looking for a better world, a better place, not built by men, but a place that is built by God. And that's a good promise to look forward to, isn't that? So how important is home to us? We already know. But I like the fact that God knows home is important to us, the whole concept of home. And not just a temporary home, but an eternal home. Didn't you know that God loves this whole concept of home? He does. In John chapter 14, the disciples were getting really nervous because Jesus was kind of hinting more and more at his crucifixion, which is coming up, right? You remember Jesus said that the Son of God is going to be crucified, but on the third day he'll rise? And what was Peter's response? No way. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Now, Peter didn't understand, but that was his response, right? Peter was nervous. When Peter heard that, he was like, no way, that's not going to happen. Well, it did happen, and it needed to happen. But the point is that the more Jesus talked about this, the more the disciples were getting nervous, and just before that Passion Week, just before Gethsemane, Jesus had that long prayer in John chapters um, 15, 16, and 17, 
But just before that, in John chapter 14, Jesus turns to the disciples and he, he says this very tender thing to them. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. That's a God who loves the idea of home. Amen? And not just any home, but an eternal home. And what a thought that the Father and the Son would be building a place for us. I don't know how that works. I know Jesus is flesh and blood now and will be eternally right. He'll have the nail prints on his hands. But he says he's building a house. So, you know, we know he's our high priest, but somehow he's involved in building us a better place than what we find here. Amen? And that's a good thing. God loves the idea of home. He wants us to love the idea of home. He wants us to love the idea that he has an eternal home that is being prepared for us. A home that is not riddled with war. A home where everybody is equal. A home where you don't need to look over your shoulder at night. A home where, where you don't have to worry about your neighbors, right? A home where you can feel free, be free, and be completely 100% at peace with the world around you. Amen? That sounds like a home worth looking for. You share these things, and some people say, that just really sounds hard to believe. Have you ever heard that expression? I don't know, the whole thing about heaven, that just kind of sounds hard to believe. Well, you know that people are saying now that they can't believe what's going on in Ukraine. You see it all over the place on social media. I can't tell you how many times I've seen the expression, I can't believe this is happening in the 21st century. Yeah. Right? Unbelievable. But yet it's happening, isn't it? Sometimes what the Bible says, what times what God has told us seems unbelievable. But guess what? We should believe it's a reality. Amen? Amen. A reality. And we need to believe it as a reality because that is faith. So Jesus shared with the disciples, they wanted to know, when are you coming, Lord? You know, can you tell us just how we have an idea? How can we have an idea that you're coming is soon? He told, he asked, the disciples asked him this in Matthew chapter 24. And we'll just skim through some of these things. I don't want to be too long. I just kind of want to focus on this thought. I'm not even sure if I'm going to share everything in my message because I just, sometimes God puts on your heart. You know what I mean? Just share what's on your heart. Don't stick so much to the notes. But I do believe this is important. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, let's just stop there for one second. Why would the disciples ask this of Jesus? Well, first, they loved Jesus, right? They had been with him a long time. I mean, Jesus was the man, right? He was their best friend. They had been chased. They had been ridiculed. They had seen... People try to kill Jesus himself, and Jesus miraculously avoided the crowd that was trying to kill him. I mean, the disciples had been through a lot. They were bonded to Jesus, but also remember their background. They had left a lot. You know, Matthew left his, his lucrative, shady business <laughs> as a tax collector, well, hated by the Jews, maybe legitimate according to the Romans' eyes, but, you know, he had left that. He could have been rolling in the dough still. Peter, James, and John left their... their lifelong occupation. I mean, these were fishermen, and that was their living. They left everything. You know, these guys were living in the world. This was their home, but they wanted something better, right? And they knew that Jesus kept promising them a better future. And so they wanted to know, Lord, how will we know when you're coming? I mean, you know, is, is life just going to go on and on and on and on forever, and we'll never have any idea, and just you'll just surprise us one day? Well, Jesus gave some significant re things to keep an eye on. He said, take heed that no one deceives you, so, deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And we know that this has happened all throughout history, right? Uh, how many times have somebody popped up in Florida claiming that they were Jesus, right? <laughs> Several times. I know about eight years ago, there was a guy in Florida. Many people in California, you know, you go to L.A., probably at least 25 people claim that they're Jesus. So, and that's kind of like on a funny note, but, but then there's the real legitimate spiritual leaders in dark places around the world who claim that they are Christ incarnate. I mean, this is like, this is like real stuff. So he says, make sure that you know that, that 
many are going to say that I am the Christ and will deceive many. And then he says, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Are we, have we heard of wars and rumors of wars? I mean, that's nothing new. So we don't want to say just because Ukraine happened, that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. We need to be careful about how we apply the Bible, right? But certainly we're living in a time where wars, where we live, it feels like the very stability of our world hangs by a thread. Isn't that right? And why is that? I mean, if everybody, everybody was still running around with sticks and stones, right, and bows and arrows, not so big of a deal. You guys are there across the globe. We're here. But Russia's got 6,000 nuclear weapons. The United States has 5,000. NATO together, I'm not sure many how, how many nuclear weapons are, you know, with all of NATO together. We're talking nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction, <laughs> Right? Not sticks and stones anymore. So the wars and the rumors of wars that, that we're hearing of these days are on a whole different scale, right? Now, contextually, Jesus was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and he said some bad things are going to happen before Jerusalem is destroyed. But Jesus was making a two-fold prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem and then the events just before his coming, because he's talking about in the context of the disciples' question, just before his coming. Wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And I think that's where I said, hmm, the phrase Jesus used, see that you are not troubled. I think that's where the whole title came from. Because honestly, I'm troubled. <laughs> you know, now, now bear with me, because I'm not going against what Jesus said. I'm just saying I'm troubled. Are you troubled by what you see? It should trouble us, right? It should always trouble us when people are attacked unprovoked. Amen. It should always trouble us when people are being oppressed. And what is going on in Ukraine definitely troubles me because there are a lot of innocent people there. I don't know if you saw the video of the tank that ran over that car. That's a, a miracle that that person survived. And, and the crowd was trying to extra, extricate the guy from the, the car, and I believe they eventually did. It didn't look like he even had a scratch on him. A tank drove over his car, Russian tank. Incredible stuff. So when you see this sort of stuff, it should trouble us in the sense that it should make us mad at the injustice of this world, right? God didn't call us. Jesus didn't call us to sit back and just act like everything's all rosy and it doesn't bother me, so it's fine. It's not fine, right? Jesus was a savior of justice. And Isaiah talks about oh, relieving the oppression of the injustice, right? So we should be troubled, but we should also realize that that is not what the Greek word means. In fact, um, I didn't, Chris read it from the, a translation that um, said, don't be surprised by these things, right? That is a more accurate translation. King James says troubled, New King James says troubled. More accurate translation says don't be surprised. A little bit of a difference, right? Be troubled, be concerned. These things should bother you, but don't be surprised. Because this is the world in which we live. And Jesus says these things are going to continue to happen. But they're going to start happening on a different scale just before his coming. I believe we're living at that time in earth's history. Amen. I mean, how much further along can we go when everybody's got an arsenal of nukes? We know for a fact that if nukes start getting set off and they can't be shot down or whatever have you, we can literally wipe out the planet. I don't believe that's going to happen because obviously God is not going to allow that. God has a plan for his people, and he's already told us how things will unfold just before he comes back. He's not coming back to a planet that's been crispified, right, by nuclear weapons. Jesus is coming back for a people living, alive, waiting for him, and coming back for those who have died in him in faith, right? Amen. Amen. That's right. So he talks about these wars and rumors of wars. And then he mentions a few, well, a few things, other. Nation will rise against nation, nothing new. Kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilences, earthquakes. Have we seen all these things? Yeah. Earthquakes. There's more earthquakes that have occurred in the past 15 years than have occurred in all the previous history. They've studied this. They've researched this. We, things are changing. We're at a different place in Earth's history, biblically speaking. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. I've shared this with the church many times, and we just need to keep being reminded of these things. Let's be careful with how we are troubled, right? We need to be troubled. We need to be upset about injustice, but not to the point where it sucks the love out of us for, for people, right? Because when that happens, we become so divided 
we ourselves become in a state of fragility, right? We become very fragile. The very infrastructure of our country seemed to be at threat in the past couple of years because it became so polarized. Isn't that right? So we ought to be upset, but we have to be so careful to know to keep ourselves in check that we don't look at people as just objects, right? You believe this, so I hate you. You believe this, oh, you can be my friend. People are people, right? Yeah. And people are imperfect, so we need to love all people regardless of their belief systems, maybe not join them, and obviously some of them need to be tossed in prison, but we need to be careful that the love that we have in our hearts doesn't grow cold. Amen? Amen. And then Jesus says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And I think this statement of his is kind of rhetorical to what he has said previously, because if you can make it through all the other stuff, having faith, right, and trusting in God, you'll still be in a good place with God, with the Lord when he comes. Amen? Does that make sense? So we need to keep our eyes on Jesus, I think is the, is the, the point. We can't get so absorbed by the negativity in our world that we become depressed and useless. We need to be aware of what is going on in the world, but we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and fixed on our homeland, our heavenly homeland. Amen to that. Um, Peter said something, which is important. Peter said, knowing this, that first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus has since Jesus rose from the dead. Isn't that right? And we can be tempted to think 2,000 years, maybe we don't really understand all this stuff properly. Maybe, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach, um, and you can confirm this, Joe, that things will eventually just kind of morph and roll into the kingdom of God. Am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. Kind of in a, in a sense? Yeah. You know, and so some people believe that. But when you look at the Bible, Jesus talks about a literal second coming as far as the east is to the west. So, and lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus talks about a literal, visible return of him to this earth, right, to set things straight. So, yes, sometimes it may seem like things are just going to continue on as they've ever been since creation. But Peter makes the point that when we get into that mindset, we willfully forget that God created this world. That his plan of redemption is set, and he does know the day and the hour, and he is coming back. Jesus promised the disciples, I will come again. Amen. Right? Amen. Didn't he say that? That was a promise to them. Don't be troubled. I will come again and receive you to myself. Jesus is coming back and we can take him at his word. Uh, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying God ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. None of us claim to be perfect, but that is our aim, right? looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can't be any clearer than that. Jesus is coming again, and we can literally look for that and expect him. So what is transpiring in the world around us should remind us of one thing, that Jesus is coming again. I believe we ought to do what we can to help when it's within our power to help people who are being oppressed, right? I think we need to do that. I think as human beings, we have an obligation to do that. But we also look beyond the affairs of this world and we look to a more glorious kingdom and we recognize that we are just pilgrims and strangers, right? Because our citizenship, though maybe linked to an address here on earth, really our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. And this is why we ought to look forward to what God has planned in the future. And God will wipe away how many tears? Oh, yeah. Every tear from their eyes. It was pretty touching when I looked on um, Fox News, there was a, a picture of a 21-year-old kid who was the only one guarding a walking bridge with a gun as the Russians were approaching. And he told the person who was kind of asking him questions, he said that he was terrified. He was terrified for his own life, but he was also terrified for the life of his family who was somewhere in the city hiding. You know? Will he make it? Did he make it? We don't know. Will his family survive? We don't know. If they don't, those families are connected to other people. There's going to be a lot of tears. There's a lot of tears now. Lots of tears. But God promises us that one day he's going to set the record straight. Amen. 
one day he's going to heal us so that there is no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. That's why we look for a better country. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Is it worth having faith in a God like that? Yes. Absolutely. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write these things, for these words are true and faithful. I love how the angel in Revelation tells John, write these things down, for they're true and faithful. Right? God cannot lie. Amen. It's important, I think, that we are reminded that we hear it from God's own lips that he's not going to go back on his word. Hebrews 10, 37, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. And one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible, this really is the call that we should all be giving to those around us who don't know Jesus. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. How much does the gospel cost? Zero, right? It costs you your reputation sometimes. Sometimes it costs you your friends. But as far as the gift of eternal life, it's free by faith. Amen to that? Amen. We are saved by grace through faith. That is the God that we serve who says to everyone, take the water of life freely. I look forward to a new home, don't you? I look forward to the home where the heart is. My heart is here to a degree, but my heart really is in heaven waiting for that new home that God is going to give us. God's going to recreate this world. There's the new Jerusalem where we'll go and worship God, you know, continually. But then this world will be recreated. And you can read that in Isaiah. We're going to build homes. Animals that fight and eat each other now, they're going to be like walking along with little kids. You can read all about this in the Bible. This is, worth, this is good stuff, people. <laughs> this is the gospel. Good news, not bad news, right? God's building us a new home, and you can have it if you have Jesus. Amen. Right, Roberta? Amen. Where's Roberta? Oh, there she is. <laughs> yeah, I knew you'd say amen. So are you tired of this world? I'm tired of this world. There's a lot of stuff in this world that I like, but I'd throw it all away if I could take, had to choose between that and Jesus. Amen? amen? You're tired of being separated from families and friends? God has an awesome plan of reuniting his people, your loved ones, my loved ones, because that's the God that we serve. <clears throat> Well, if that's what you feel, that's how you feel this morning, if that is your source of joy, then join me as I pray and thank God for that. Father, we look at the world around us, truly a mess, and we know we can make it a little better, Lord, as we extend love and emphasize equality and fight for the freedom of others. We can make this place a better place, but Lord, we know that it'll never be a perfect place. We want to live with you in that perfect place, Lord, that city that you're building where every one of us has a special place with our name on it. Lord, we want to live in the new earth. We want, we want these things to become the former things. And it is our prayer today, Lord, that those who we know and love who have not accepted the name of Jesus, that they would come to know you, not as the God of rules and justice and retribution, but the God of love and friendship because that's what your word teaches us, Lord. We pray for that. We know that time will not linger forever. We see the signs, and we know that Jesus is coming soon. And on this thought, as we enjoy our freedom in this country and enjoy even the, the glorious hope that our faith brings, we do pray for those in Ukraine who are terrified at this moment, who are living in fear. We pray that somehow, Lord, decisions will be made, things will be undone so that this can stop soon. We pray for that for all the people there. We also pray for those especially of faith, those children of yours who are, are scared, Lord, and are worried about their families. We're praying that angels would be there to, to help shield and protect. Lord, we know these things have to transpire because that's the nature of evil, and people need to be given more opportunity. But one day, Lord, we look forward to the day when you come back, the devil's unmasked, and all this deception and chaos and self-serving will come to an end. We look forward to that day, and we're thankful that it is soon. So thank you for hope today. Bless us now, the rest of this day. May the day find us being hopeful in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 May you be blessed today. Got a closing hymn, and that is 240.
fairest, Lord Jesus. I just noticed the singing sounds so much better without masks. Everybody notice that? <laughs> it really does. All right, Father, we thank you so much for our time together. Help us to not forget the hope found in your word. Use us, Lord, as a healing balm in the lives of others where that may be a possibility. Now bless us from this place. See us safely in our travels. We do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless everybody.